Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to endure on the daily, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the disappearance and subsequent murder of 19-year-old Katie Boyer. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week without fail, and I'd love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. And you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. They are all Bratterstein, but no pressure. All right, now that I'm done begging you to join my cult, we can go ahead and get into this video. Now, this is a video on a case that was suggested to me by a member of the Brat Pack, a woman named Becca. Hi, Becca. Thank you, Becca. Me and Becca talk on Instagram here and there from time to time. And she's recommended this case to me because this is a case that happened in her hometown of Moose Lake, Minnesota, which is just the most adorable town name I've ever hold, hold, heard in my life. Moose Lake? That's very cute. And it's one of those cases that I had never heard of before. And it surprised me because it seems like it's a very big deal in Moose Lake. Well, I mean, I've, obviously every murder is a big deal, right? This was somebody's life that has been cut short. But this is the type of case that went from just being local coverage to like national coverage. And it seems like at that time, there was people from all over the country coming to Minnesota to search for Katie in hopes that they would find her alive. Sadly, though, that would never happen because Katie was murdered and she was murdered by a man that police believe is a serial killer. And he was brought down in a very interesting way because Katie's body was never recovered. It's never been recovered. Therefore, this is a solved case with no body. So I've looked into this case extensively, man. Like I got, this is one of those ones that really, really got me. And I researched it so fast because I literally could not stop reading about it. Like every waking moment for two straight days, it was just like consumption, consumption, consumption on this case because I found it so interesting. And just so sad because Katie seemed like she was such a nice girl with so much life ahead of her 19 years old. That's a literal child. You know what I mean? Um, so I've looked into everything so you don't have to. And today I'm going to tell you the entire story. And after I'm done, I want you to answer the question of the day. And that is this. Do you believe that the man who killed Katie is a serial killer? And if you do not, what do you think his motive was for taking her that day? Now, with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the disappearance and subsequent murder of 19 year old Katie Hoyer. And I want to start this video off with us jumping in our handy dandy time machine and heading to 1999 to Moose Lake, Minnesota. It's this little, little town of just like 22,000 people. Like they're really 22,000, 2,200 people. Okay. Real small town vibes where people have literally the most charming accent I've ever heard in my entire life. I want to go to Minnesota just to listen to people talk. I had never really like sat and listened to so many people from this place speak. And I found it to be absolutely adorable, but that's neither here nor there. Moose Lake was like, a, I don't know if it still is, but at the time it was like a nice little chill ass lakeside community, real small, where a lot of tourists would come because it was basically entirely, not entirely on the water, but there was water everywhere. Moose lake, if you will. The community there was described as small in size, but large in heart. And they were about to be rocked by something horrible happening to them, like to somebody so close to them because it was such a small tight knit place. And it was happening on Memorial Day weekend, 1999, when a bunch of people were there trying to have a good time, you know, lakes, people were coming in in droves to just have like a nice weekend, but it was going to be an absolute nightmare for one of the locals. On May 26, 1999, Katie Elizabeth Poyer went missing from a convenience store that was attached to a gas station that was near the outskirts of town, where she was working the graveyard shift as a clerk. Katie Poyer was a college student who was actually studying law enforcement because she wanted to be a conservation officer. And she had her whole life going for it, dude. She was only 19 years old in college, newly engaged to her longtime boyfriend, I believe his name was Mark, and she had plans to move to and to settle down in Montana. 
She was the type of girl who just did things, you know, like she was, was she an Aries? No, she was born February 28th. So she was a Pisces, but she had literally never been to Montana. She just liked the outdoors and the mountains. And she knew that Montana offered both of those things. So she's like, okay, I guess I'm, I guess I'm going to Montana. Katie was just the typical college girl, right? She would come home to her parents' house and do her laundry, say her hello, steal some food, all that jazz, you know? And Katie was a smart girl. She went in school. She had been an honor roll student and a musician. And this girl was beautiful inside and out. She was even named the first runner up for the title of Miss Barnum, which I believe is like a beauty pageant. And she loved the outdoors. As I said, she loved being outside. She wanted to move to Montana. She loved water skiing, fishing. She liked football, her team being the, uh, the Green Bay Packers. And she loved soap operas, her favorite being the um, Days of Our Lives. That was actually my mom's favorite when I was growing up, so I am lightly familiar. And she also loved animals. She had two dogs that she loved named Goldie and Riley. Katie's family said of her, and I quote, Katie had a mile wide smile and simply loved life and everyone in it. She will always be remembered and she will always be a precious part of everyone who was fortunate enough to know her. When Katie was abducted, a beautiful woman literally just doing her job when she was snatched up out of nowhere, people were shocked. And when she went missing, it was wild because like the only reason anyone even knew she went missing is because, well, I mean, they would have found out eventually, but it's because, okay, she had been working at this gas station. This is one of those gas stations that's, um, it's a convenience store. It's attached to a gas station and has like a subway in it. You know, the ones at the edge of the freeway on the outskirts of town where you could get off the freeway, stop, get gas, get food, get all your things, get back on the road. Well, a woman came in, I believe it was a woman, a patron came into the, the convenience store and realized that nobody was there. Nobody who worked there was there. And clearly they had been, it was open, the lights were on, the lights were on, but nobody was home. So worried about what they were seeing, the customer called into the police and was like, hey, listen, I'm at the convenience store. The lights are on. People are in here shopping, but whoever works here just isn't there. They're nowhere to be found. And this is such a small knit place, like a small tight knit community that the officer knew exactly who was supposed to be working there when they got that call. They knew that it was Katie and knew that she should be there. This officer had even seen Katie earlier that evening. He knew that like she was working way out there in the middle of nowhere on the outskirts of town, all by herself, super far from like any other people and any other businesses. So he had actually drove on, drove on, drove on over, drove all over, popped in, asked her how she was doing, made sure everything was cool. And he said when she was there, she seemed like her happy, normal self. Like there was nothing amiss at all. The same officer who had came and saw Katie earlier in the evening was the one who responded to this call. And when he got there, he realized that it was exactly how it, how it had been described over the call. Like the lights were on, people were in the store. There were customers in the store who said they'd been there about 20 minutes, but there was no sign of Katie. So he decided to look around the store and see if maybe she had gotten hurt was somewhere in the back, was just somewhere out of sight, maybe unconscious. But he quickly realized that she was nowhere to be found. And when they started to look around the store, it appeared that she must have been gone for a little while because there was actually money and notes on the counter from people who had came into the store, needed to buy something. And they were like, well, I guess I'm gonna do this on the honor system because I'm not a piece of shit, which is nice. It's nice that people actually did that and didn't just steal shit because you know how people do be doing. But there was money and notes on the counter because Katie hadn't been there to take their money. So it, sh it appeared to police that she had been gone a little while by this time. And right away, police were pretty sure that she didn't leave on her own because all of her stuff was still in the store. Her purse, her car keys, her car was still in the freaking parking lot. Like, and she's super far from any businesses, so she's not just gonna take off on foot, but it also didn't appear that there was like a fight inside the store. There was no sign of a struggle. There was nothing knocked over. The displays were standing up just fine. It's like she had just vanished. If she had, like there was nothing to indicate that anything had gone wrong, except for the fact that Katie was gone. And the same cop, the one who knew her, um, the one who knew her and had seen her, we're talking about the same cop. There's more than one cop in the story, but right now we're still talking about the same guy. He knew that something was wrong. He knew Katie. He knew Katie wouldn't just leave her post. He knew that she was too far to like walk anywhere. So he knew right away that something was wrong. So he actually went out, he searched her car. He didn't find anything in the car. He didn't find anything in the parking lot. So he even went as far as to walk by to a nearby truck stop to see if there was any sign of her there, but there was no sign of her there either. So at this point, police were like, okay, we need to go to her apartment. Maybe she's at her apartment. And if not, we can speak to her fiance. So they head there, they knock on the door and who's there, who answers the door? Not Katie, it's her fiance, obviously. You know the story that we're into. So 
they ask if Katie's there. She's not. They let him know that she is missing and they question him about it. And he has no idea where she would be. No idea why anyone would take her. Everyone who talked about Katie, including her fiance said Katie had no enemies. So none of this made any sense. And while this is happening, meanwhile, there's also, you know, investigators still at the scene investigating as they do. And they realize that there are surveillance cameras at the convenience store. Thank Job. So now they just have to determine whether or not they were on and actually recording at the time of the abduction and only time will tell. Actually, that's not accurate. I will tell you right now. Yes, they were working <laughs> and they were able to recover some usable footage. So there wasn't just one camera at the scene. There were actually four different cameras and they were pointing at different areas in the store. So police were like, oh, fuck yeah, I bet you that we can figure out what happened to Katie. We can see something useful on these tapes. So they call the manager of the convenience store and they're like, yo, can you please bring those over? Thank you very much. We would like to look at them so you can find our girl. So they wait for the, the tapes to come. And meanwhile, they start processing the scene further and they are able to determine that the last transaction that Katie um, made, like on the, the cash register, was at around 11.30 p.m. So they at least had like a starting point on where to look. They also try, which seems like a, a fool's errand, if you if you ask me, if you ask me my opinion, which I guess you want my opinion because you're here, or you just want the story and I should stop giving opinions. Um, I'm not sure, let me know <laughs> which you would prefer. Don't, I don't want you to hurt my feelings. Anyways, they start dusting the gas station, the convenience store for fingerprints, but the problem was this was a gas station. There was a million fingerprints everywhere, so they didn't find this to be especially useful. But you know, you gotta cover all your bases. So at least they try. So police get the footage they've been waiting for. They get the footage from the, the manager, they pop it in and they come to find that it is super, super grainy. It's like four images on one screen, like all together condensed. It's super grainy and there's no audio. So it's not totally useless because like it exists, but it's, it's kind of useless, right? It, it turns out to not be useless, but at the time it seemed like fuck, like this isn't gonna help us that much. But they, they start watching it, and they start watching it at 11 because they know her last transaction was at around 11, 20, 11, 30. So they start watching um, the footage at 11 so they can see everything that happens. That's like their starting point. Like obviously if they need to, they'll go earlier, they'll go later, but right now starting off at 11. So they watch, they watch, they watch, they watch. And about 11, 30, a man walks into the store. They can't tell anything really about this guy because again, it's incredibly grainy, but he walks around the store and he seems like he's talking to Katie and the conversation seems by body language to be like a normal friendly conversation. They thought that she might even know him because of how casual it seemed. And then he walked out of the store and she walked into the back like she had been doing something. She realized he was there. She came out, she talked to him. He left, she went into the back. Totally normal, right? Until it wasn't. They keep watching. The guy maybe like, less than a minute after walking out of the store and Katie walking into the back, he returns to the store and he heads straight for the back where Katie is going off of frame. And the next thing you see is him walking back with Katie with what appears to be a cord wrapped around her neck, like from behind. And she's like this and he's holding her neck and holding the cord and he leads her straight out of the store. So the police chief sees this and immediately realizes this is, this is going to be past his department's expertise, which like, slow clap for the chief of police and putting his ego aside and being like, we need to save this girl. Cause he sees it. And he's like, if this young, pretty girl has been abducted, it's not for anything good. So he immediately calls the FBI and the Minnesota, Minnesota Bureau of criminal apprehension. That's not a, that's not, that's not a new one to me. That is a new one to me. It's one that I'm not familiar with, but he calls them in right away. Cause he knows he's going to need all the manpower and all the help that he can get to bring Katie home safe. The officer that we talked about in the beginning, the one that knew Katie was the one to go over and give her family the news that she had been taken. And it was incredibly hard for them, as I'm sure you can imagine. Like, I honestly can't imagine, like I can and I can't. It seems like the most impossible thing in the world. It seems like the sad, the, I feel like somebody being missing has to be the most terrifying thing in the world. And to know, because it's been recorded that she was actually taken is truly unimaginable. And this was incredibly hard for her family, I guess. Her mom and dad found out and then her mom like went into her son's like basement room. I think he had a room in the basement and just like opened the door and started like yelling and was like, um, they took her, they took her and he didn't know what's going on. He was 21 at the time and he woke up and he's like, took who? Like she didn't say the name Katie. He's like, who is her? 
Like, ah, I was asleep and now I'm awake. Who, what are you talking about? And her mom couldn't even get the words out of her mouth. And then her dad came in and was like, somebody abducted your sister. And he said that it was just like the hardest thing in the world that basically you go numb and you just can't even hear anything. So from there, his parents had to go and deal with like all the technicalities that come with something like this happening. And he stayed home in case she called, somebody else called, you know, like ransom style, something like that. Or if on the off chance she escaped, she came home. And they just had a ton of trouble understanding like how to navigate the situation because she was abducted. That didn't mean she was dead. So they had to hold out hope that she would be okay, which sounds like an impossible task, but they did. They held out hope as best as they could. They worked right alongside police doing, you know, searches and taking in tips, all that jazz. And her, her mom and dad went on uh, media interviews, like not very frequently, but frequently enough that I saw footage of this. And her mom was just like, to whoever has her, please tell Katie that we love her and that we miss her and that we want her home. This family had so many people just rallying around them at all times. They would have people in their home all the time. Her brother said that there would be so many people in his house sometimes, his parents' house, that he would sleep on the kitchen floor. But despite days going by and them not finding her, they just, they held on to hope so hard because it wasn't in their blood to give up. And he said specifically, quote, you cope with hope because hope is all you have. So they just had to sit there and wait, wait as the days turned into weeks. And as Katie's case went from being a local tragedy to a national news story, people were really beside the family though, helping in any way they could. Some people even went as far as to setting up a booth at the state fair to pass out flyers because they truly felt like they just had to get Katie's image into the right person's hands and head to bring in a lead that would bring her home. A search headquarters was set up at a church in the area and people that worked there helped in handling tips. Maps were put on the wall with like large X's drawn on them to show the areas that had already been searched. And they went as far as to passing out gold and maroon ribbons for people to wear in solidarity. People are always wearing ribbons, aren't they? It's so weird. I wonder where that originated from. Cause I feel like in a lot of cases we discuss when somebody goes missing or is killed, people wear ribbons in solidarity. I wonder, I just wonder how that originated. Bailey Zarian should do a dark histories on that in case that's something that has like a bit of a morbid flip to it because it seems like it could, but that's neither here nor there. Her family was incredibly grateful to all of those who had helped, all of those who helped with the headquarters and the search. And Katie's mother said in a press conference to those who had helped her and her family during the searches, and I quote, the words thank you just doesn't seem enough to give to you, but we do. We do thank you for all your effort and Katie does too. They searched hard for Katie. They brought in dogs and they brought in helicopters and people would go and search, search through thick brush. And they did like grid searches. And there was different, like a bunch of different agencies even were brought in all to work on the same case. And volunteers from all over the country came to assist in the searches. And in addition to wearing the, the golden maroon ribbons, people would also wear buttons with Katie's face on it. And her missing persons flyer was put in newspapers and up on billboards. Like they really did try so hard to find this girl. So meanwhile, all of this is happening and police are still trying to get something from this video, right? Like the quality of this video was described as atrocious, but they were doing the best with what they could because they literally had her abduction recorded. They just needed to be able to see what this guy looked like. So the problem was, as I said, there were four images, very, very small, like do, 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 do on one screen. So they couldn't even isolate them to look at them separately because like you'd be looking at one and then you wouldn't be able to look at the other. So they actually took, the footage to a nearby casino. And I couldn't find clarity on why this casino just had like the quality, but apparently it did maybe because they're trying to catch people counting cars like in the movie 21. But um, they take the, the video there to have it at least separated into four images instead of one, one image with four images. One man with seven guns. No, it's seven men. It doesn't matter. They took the footage to the casino. And from there, they were able to get four separate images that were larger so that they could hopefully see more, but they were still even enlarged, very unclear. Police even went as far as to show Katie's family in the surveillance footage, which I cannot even imagine what that must have been like, but they were just completely out of options because they couldn't find out anything about the guy from the videotape, man. They could tell that he was 
probably white, like, but that was pretty much the extent of it. They couldn't even figure out how old he was because some people thought that because of his dress and his hairstyle that he was younger, but some thought because of the way he moved that he was older. I don't know. His, I don't know. Her family was warned about what they were going to be seeing prior to watching the video, but they were likely traumatized further by viewing this without any helpful information coming from it because her family watched it and they did not recognize the man on the tape. Fortunately though, everything wasn't complete dog shit, even though it sounds so far like it would have been. Because once police started to question those who were around the convenience store at the time Katie disappeared, they did find some useful information, particularly from a girl who worked at the subway that was in the same plaza as the convenience store. Now, this woman said that the night that Katie disappeared, she had been alone in her store closing up when a man had come into the subway. And she said that he wanted to come in to use the bathroom. And she was like, like, no, you, you can't do that. And he tried to like walk through the subway to get into the convenience store. Cause they were like connected. If you've been into one of those gas station type situations, you know what I'm talking about. So he tried to go through and she's like, no guy, like I'm closed up. The door's locked. You can't do that. She was closing up. All the lights were off and she had been in the back when he came in. So when he's asking to do this, she's like, no. And in addition to all of that, I'm closed. The lights are off. The door is locked. You can't be in here. He also appeared to be drunk. So she was like, I'm sorry, but you're going to need to go and just go. So he did. He left and she immediately locked up the doors after he departed the facility. That's a good sentence, right? After he vacated the premises. Those are the words I was looking for. So after this woman locks up and leaves, she stops in at the convenience store to say bye to Katie. The two knew each other. They worked, you know, in very close proximity and they would just chat all the time. They talk dudes as women do as us birds do be gabbing about men, right? That's what we do. So she went in, she talked to her, but on this night she, she couldn't stay and talk very long. She said normally she would stay and chat for a little bit of time, but she had dinner plans with her husband. So she just went in and was like, Hey, I'm leaving. I just wanted to say goodbye. They said their goodbyes and she left. And this was the last time she ever saw Katie. But this was not the last time that she saw the creepy dude who came into her subway, right? So she leaves Katie's store. She's walking down the sidewalk and who does she run into? Creepy subway guy. And he's just standing at the end of the walkway. Just like, she felt like waiting for her. He was just standing there. And he says to her like, are you done for the evening? And she's like, what the fuck do you think you creepy old dude? I got my purse. I got my keys. Like I have all my stuff. You think I'm just out here walking for my health? She didn't say that, but she thought that. And luckily for her, he let her just walk by. He got into his truck and he left. She got into her car and she left and they luckily were going in the same direction. So she was following behind him for a while. And she said that he was even driving drunk. Now, all of this was very lucky for police because she had had a close encounter, well, two close encounters with this guy. So she was able to give them a pretty good description. She described the man as in his forties with blonde hair that seemed to be turning gray. And it was down to a little past his collar and police took a still image from the surveillance photo, photo video, and they showed it to her. But unfortunately she couldn't tell because of how shitty the quality was if it was the same guy, but wait, there's more. She was also able to give them some information on his vehicle. She said that it was a black or dark colored Ford F-150 pickup truck. And it was more distinct than that. It had notable lines painted on the side and an air gate on the back. She had even noticed that it was a Minnesota license plate and remembered some of the numbers and letters. And this kind of blew police's minds because one officer said that generally people don't even remember what state the license plate was from. And she not only remembered the state, but she remembered four of the six digits. She even remembered that the right side of the plate, like the right upper corner was slightly bent. She told police that she was only able to remember so much from this guy and his truck and everything because he gave her the creeps. There was something in his eyes that just, unsettled her. So from her description, the police were able to put together a laughable composite sketch. Like why did these always look so bad? That really is the question. And I do not know the answer, but they did the best they could with what they had. And they put that out along with still images from the surveillance video. They then went on to search the like vehicle database to see how many black or dark colored Ford F-150 pickup trucks that had that combination of letters and numbers were in Minnesota. And they were shocked to find that there were a shit ton. So I can only imagine that at that point, they were just like, 
come the fuck on, man. Can we get a break here? But police did get a break. They got a break when a tip came in, and this was a tip on a man named Donald. Donald Christensen. And when they looked into him, they found that he had committed a couple of sex crimes. So they were like, oh, okay, that's some information. So they talked to him and he denies it 100% obviously, because why would you not deny it? But he does admit that he has been drinking a little more lately than he typically did. And if you remember, Katie's friend who worked at Subway said that the man who came into her store seemed drunk. Now police go and they search this man's house. And when they do, in his trash can, they find something interesting. They find cable, like rope, knotted up in the trash can. And it looked like it could have been similar to the rope that was seen on the surveillance video from when Katie was abducted. How they could tell, I have no idea since the footage was so grainy, but they could. Now, I don't know why Donald agreed to do this. I really don't, but because it just seems so weird to me, but he agreed to go with police to the convenience store, okay? And he was gonna walk around the convenience store and walk in the same path that Katie's abductor had walked and pose in sa the same positions that Katie's abductor had posed in so that police could compare images of him taken with still images they had taken from the surveillance video. So they do that. They walk him around the store, parade him around the store. He poses, Zoolander, whatever, um, for these images and they were able to find that he was not a match for the man in the video who took Katie. And this was very obvious to them because Donald Christensen had a notable spiderweb tattoo on his forearm, but the man in the surveillance videos did not. Now, it does seem like police probably could have figured this out without walking him around the store, but maybe Moose Lake police have a flair for the dramatic, <laughs> just like my phone right now. So police move on to the next suspect and coincidentally, it's another man named Donald. Like, what are the odds of that? I don't know, but his name is Donald Bloom. And he comes up on the list of people who own a vehicle who would fit um, the license plate number and the description. And he lived about two hours from the convenience store, two hours away from the convenience store in Richfield, Minnesota. So they contact an officer from Richfield and they send her on over to Donald's home. And when she gets there, she speaks to Donald's wife. And from that conversation is convinced that this is not their guy. Cause they talk to her. They're like, yo, we're here about your truck. And she's like, first off, our truck is white, not black. Get your facts straight. And second off, we sold that like months ago. So you've definitely been barking up the wrong tree. So they scratch that name off the list. Clearly this is not their guy either. So running out of leads, one of the officers got the bright idea to contact NASA. Now, to me, this seems like wild. I would have never thought of that, but that's why I'm not an investigator. But apparently NASA had some technology at the time that they were using to clean up images so that they could actually look at like images of the sun. And they were like, this could be useful to us because we literally have four goddamn photos of this man, like four different angles of this man kidnapping this girl. And yet we can't see her. How frustrating that must have been. I can't even imagine. It drives me crazy to even think about it. So they contact NASA and they're like, yo, NASA, would you like to use your technology to help a um, kidnapped girl from potentially being murdered because she was kidnapped, but we think she might still be alive and you would have the potential of saving her with your technology. And they were like, this seems like a pretty dumb question because obviously, absolutely, I do. And they're like, okay, cool. Can you do this as quickly as possible? Because she may still be alive out there. Now the science behind what NASA was doing is confusing to me because um, I'm not an actual rocket scientist like they are. But essentially from what I understand, how it works is they take a bunch of images, like overlapping images from video. Okay. They lay them over each other. And from doing that, they're able to put together a still image. Now, when they go to do this to the footage from the convenience store, they find that instead of taking 30 images per second, like most videos do, this one took one image per second. So they didn't have the necessary images they would need to overlap unless the guy stood still close enough to a camera to be visible for several seconds at a time because they needed images to lap over. And he just didn't do that very much. So they were not even able to get a clear image of his face, but it wasn't a total wash. They were able to get a clear enough image of his shirt. And they found that what he was wearing was a, like a striped New York Yankees Jersey with the number 23 on the back. And they were also able to determine that this was not a young man 
which is what they were thinking. They were thinking it was a guy that was in his 20s or in his 30s, but he was found to be older than that, probably 40s or even 50s. And they could tell from the images that he had his hair dyed in a strange way. So they did get some information, just they didn't get the image of his face like they were hoping for. So at this point, police want to release this information to get some help from the public to help identify the man in the jersey by the jersey. And they do this in a wild way. They actually contact a famous baseball player in the area to use him to like market the disappearance and to like basically this person, this baseball player, recorded a message describing what the man looked like talking about Katie's disappearance. And they put that out in the media to get people to pay closer attention because you know people just love celebrities. The man they reached out to is a man named Paul Molitor, which, forgive me, I do not know sports at all, but apparently he's a big deal in Minnesota. So this guy, I mean, I don't know anything about him, but he seems like a cool guy if this is any example of who he is as a person because he was like, yeah, absolutely, I'll do that. Like a missing girl, I'm on board. So he filmed this video urging the public for any information on this man and on Katie's disappearance. And the police took it and they ran that freaking ad all the goddamn time. They were like, let's get our, not money's worth, because I doubt they paid him, but let's get the most we can out of this endorsement. And this was successful. Running this ad resulted in them getting a call from a person who worked at a veteran's home. This was a man named Daryl, and he said that he had a coworker that he thought might be the guy they were looking for because this coworker drove a black Ford pickup truck. He owned and often wore a jersey that was exactly like the one in the video that they had released. He also didn't come into work the day after Katie disappeared. And when he finally did come back to work, he had changed his appearance. He had cut his hair, which was the one physical description that had been released about the suspect over the media, and tried to grow a beard. And then, after all that, he just up and quit his job that he had worked at for a while with no notice. This guy's name, the guy he was calling about, was Donald Hutchinson. Another Donald bro. Well, kind of. This Donald had charges against him for sexual crimes and kidnapping. And they found from looking into him that Donald Hutchinson was just one of the several names that he used, which included Donald Pence, Donald Franklin, and Donald Bloom. Do you remember that name? Donald Bloom, that's the guy. That's the guy when the police went over to Richfield and they interviewed the guy's wife and she was like, what? Black truck, we, one, check it back. We don't have a black truck. We had, not have, had a white truck and we don't have it anymore. So that's not my man. That is the Donald that this guy is calling in to say, I think this might be the guy who took Katie. Did you see that coming? Now the same suspect's name coming across police's desks twice while looking into a specific case already is a little bit of a red flag, right? Like maybe this is something to really be looking at. But in addition to that, another thing that really made him stand out to police was his record. And not like a little record, like a big old fucking creep record, to say the least. This man, Donald, had a record of terrifying violence against women. Well, not just women, girls. In 1975, when Donald was in his 20s, he kidnapped a 14-year-old girl, a 14-year-old child, okay? He gagged her and he raped her before locking her in the trunk of his car. But she was able to escape and she turned him in and he was convicted and given clearly not enough time because by 1978, so that was just a couple of years later, he was apparently out because he committed aggravated assault. Then again in 1983, he was arrested for criminal sexual conduct, but that wasn't all. The same year, the same year that he uh, was arrested for the criminal sexual conduct, sorry, I'm getting real hyped. The same year he was arrested for the criminal sexual conduct, he pulled a knife on two teenage girls and then took them out into the middle of nowhere and tied them to a tree and put socks in their mouths to gag them. Now this is gonna be upsetting, but what Donald then did is he took one of the girls and he choked her into unconsciousness and then revived her. And he did this over and over while the other girl, because there was two of them, watched, all the while telling them that he was going to rape them. Now, the only reason that these girls weren't killed by him, in my opinion, I think he was going to kill them, is because a police officer had been driving by and he saw the girl's car on the side of the road parked in the wrong direction, so he pulled over to investigate. And when this cop approached the three of them, Donald and these two girls, he was like deuces and he took off running into the woods and evaded capture. 
he ended up dyeing his hair to try and change his appearance, but within two months he was arrested because the whole uh, hair dyeing thing didn't do enough to camouflage his stupid fucking face, and one of the girls he terrorized actually recognized him, and he ended up pleading guilty to those crimes. And then, while in custody, he was evaluated by a psychologist, and the doctor predicted that if Donald wasn't monitored, and monitored closely, he was going to be a problem in the future. And I am sorry if I started talking so fast. When I get, like, very, like, interested in something, I talk really fast. And I have gotten comments from people like, bitch, slow down, but I can't do it, because that's not how my mouth works. But there is a button on YouTube where you can slow me down if you want to. I just apologize because I know I got very like, I caught myself and I was like, slow down, slow down just a smidge. Now, those assaults that we talked about happened back in the 80s and when Katie went missing, it was 1999. But by the time Katie went missing, this guy had a lot of past experience under his belt, much of which involved kidnapping and sexual assault. So though it was a long time ago when these things happened, police still thought that this was a man worth looking into at least because I mean, he seemed like he just liked to hurt girls you know what i mean like it's so gross so they did just that they looked into donald bloom and in doing so they found that he owned some property that they may be interested in so they headed over to a 20 acre property that donald owned in moose lake minnesota that was only 12 miles away from where katie disappeared and when they got there he was nowhere to be found but they spoke to neighbors and they found out that he was there a lot he was always at this property but ever since katie had disappeared he hadn't been back. Now this property was like a hunting lodge and it had a trailer on it, not like a mobile home. It was one of those ones, the trailers that isn't mobile, the one that just lives there. It parks and it takes up residence in that place. I can't remember what those are called, but that was there. So when police go to the property, they see this big piece of land. They see this trailer on the property. They think it's possible that Katie could be being held captive there. And it's really sad because Katie's mom felt the same way. She had this gut feeling. She had a gut feeling that she was going to find her daughter alive there, that Katie would be found alive at this trailer. But when they searched it, there was no sign of Katie. All they found in the trailer was that was like of any note was a bunch of guns. And like he was a, he had a record. He wasn't allowed to have guns. But that was hardly something that they really cared about. They were disappointed, of course, but they didn't lose hope. They really believed that they were on to the right guy. So they searched all over this property. They pumped the water out of a pond on the property and raked through the mud to try to see if they found anything, but there was nothing there. They even pumped all of the water, like in all of the debris, ugh, out of the, um, the septic tank, but there was nothing. And just when they were getting close to calling it quits, when they felt that they had searched everywhere there was to search and they had seen all there was to see, they came upon a fire pit. They could tell by looking at the pit that it had been used recently and they were sure like that it wasn't used for anything good. They were assuming that they were going to look in there and find some of Katie's belongings that he had thrown in there to try to conceal maybe a murder weapon, something like that. But when they looked, they found something much worse. They found bone fragments and a human tooth. And they found a ton of bone fragments, dude. One of the officers even said that they ended up finding about a third of a gallon of ice cream, like the pail that a gallon of ice cream would come in, a third of that pail was full of bones. So the bones and the tooth were sent to a forensic anthropologist. They sent the bones to bones. And when she looked at the, the items, the remains, she was able to tell um, nothing good, nothing good for this story. They, she was able to tell that almost all of the fragments belonged to a petite young woman. And she could tell by looking at the bones that there had still been flesh on the bones when they were burnt. And that's awful, right? But there's even more. You might have noticed that I said most of the bone fragments were from a petite young woman. Most, not all. The forensic anthropologist was, be, was being able, was able to determine that not all of the bones belonged to the same skeleton, which led her to believe that there was more than one person whose body was burned in that fire pit. So as she figured out all of that, horrible fucking stuff. Police were on their way to Donald's actual home in Richfield to search there as well. And guess what they found at the home? The black truck, you know, the one that they didn't own anymore, the one that was actually white and they had sold anyway. Yeah, they found it. It was black and on the side of it, remember the girl from Subway said that there was like a weird like stripe painted on the side. It had like a purple Saved by the Bell squiggle painted on the side and the truck was found in the family's garage. It had been there the whole three and a half weeks that Katie was missing, just being hidden in the family garage. 
When they did this search, Donald and his family were nowhere to be found, but fortunately they were able to get a tip, um, and this tip stir let police know that Donald, his wife, and his two children were camping about 200 miles away. So police jumped in their car, they headed in that direction, and they got to Donald at about midnight. Police get to the place that he's camping with his family, and they go up to him and they're like, what's up, my guy? We would like to talk to you about your black truck home. And he's like, man, what did I tell you? I told you guys, I don't even have a truck. Why are you hassling me? Man, 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 you know, like, like he did because he's a big fat liar. Because the homeboy has no idea that they've already been to his house and searched it and found his truck, right? So they um, illuminate him, illuminate him, inform him of the fact that they already know he has a truck because they've been to his house and they found it in his garage. And he starts saying some stuff and he says some sketchy stuff, some stuff that he probably didn't mean to say and regrets saying. And one of those things was like, ah, man, it wasn't me. You got the wrong guy. I've got nothing to do. I've got nothing to do. I'm not the one who took the girl in Moose Lake. And they were like, girl in Moose Lake, bro, what are you talking about? We're here to talk about a truck. We didn't mention any girl in Moose Lake. Like he just like bleh, word vomited it and they didn't even bring it up. So that never looks good. So they talked to him. He seems nervous. He seems sketchy. And needless to say, he was arrested for kidnapping Katie. Once they had him in custody, police bring in the girl who worked at Subway along with a couple of other witnesses. And they ask them if they can look at a lineup of men, like a physical lineup, not a photo lineup. And if they can tell police if any of the men in the lineup are the men, the men, the man they saw that night around the convenience store. They gave them pens and papers to write anything down that they could think of. And the girl from Subway said that she was just like clicking it away like crazy. And that as soon as she like clicking the pen nervously, and that as soon as she saw Donald Bloom, she knew it was him. Police said that Donald was friendly and cooperative, but that he was not like a spill your guts kind of guy. And he lawyered up immediately, which makes sense because of his past history with the police. He knows that that's what you do. That's what you do, guilty or not, you lawyer up. Um, and so he did. So that is a mark of like a criminal who at least knows something and has a little bit going on upstairs, but then he did something really stupid. He got caught um, with plans to try to escape the county jail. So he ended up being held in solitary confinement. Now, there was a little bit of a problem because they had these bone fragments and they had a tooth, but they didn't have the body of Katie. And when these fragments and this tooth were tested, there was no DNA, none because the fire had been so hot and had burned for so long, I guess, that all of the DNA, all of the DNA was destroyed. So they're like, shit, we have nothing to prove that this is Katie or that Katie is even dead. But then again, there was another wise decision, another out of the box thought by one of the investigators. And they're like, let's go talk to Katie's dentist. We have this tooth. Maybe this tooth could lead us somewhere that is useful. So they go and they talk to Katie's dentist and look at her dental records and all that jazz. Now, this is when they learn something very interesting. So the tooth that was found in the fire pit was a molar. And they learned from Katie's dentist that Katie had just got a filling put into the exact same molar. Like if that was her tooth, there would be a filling in that molar and she had just gotten it weeks before she died. And that's all great. Cool. Fine. People have fillings, right? I know I got like plenty of fillings. That's a normal thing, kind of, in this situation. What made this unique is that, okay, Katie's dentist had filled her tooth with a special new type of filling material. And it was a type of filling material that was not on the market yet. This shit's so crazy. So she was like the only person in that area who had it. And she had only filled like so many people's teeth with that filling, that filling material, right? Cool. And the only person who was missing and or presumed dead who had had their tooth filled with that filling material was Katie. So if this tooth was tested and the filling material in this tooth was the same as the filling material that this dentist had used, it was proof that this tooth belonged to Katie because nobody else had access to it. This was the pineapple express of dental filling material. So they test the tooth and Boom, it has a filling with the super duper rare filling material. This was Katie's 
too. So police go to Donald and they confront him with the information that they have. And he must have known that his goose was effectively cooked because he decided that he wanted to confess despite his attorney being like, maybe you don't do that because it's not going to be good for you. He said he needed to come clean, but he had some stipulations. He would do this only if he could be moved to a jail, like a facility that was in North Dakota. So he could be closer to family. Cool. So in exchange, he's going to admit what he did. And he did, he made a confession, but he definitely minimized what he did to Katie. It's believed that he minimized what happened. He simply said that he had gone to the convenience store, that he had abducted her, shoved her in his truck, and then drove her to his hunting property, where he just basically immediately strangled her. He said that like he didn't give a motive for why he did what he did. And he didn't give a lot of information between the abduction and the strangulation. He said he wasn't sure why he did it. He said he had just gone to that convenience store that night and then instead of buying something, he took Katie. He says that she begged him over and over to let her go, but that she didn't really put up a fight, not until they got to the hunting property. And once they got there, she, he says that she really, really tried to fight him off. And then at one point she started to get away and then he chased her down and he grabbed her from behind and he strangled her to death. He says he strangled her from behind with his bare hands and that it took about 20 minutes for her to die. And he says that he did not sexually assault her, but I have to be honest, I kind of don't believe that at all, especially with his past. I do not believe that either, I don't believe that he didn't do it, or I don't believe that that wasn't his intention in taking her in the first place. Now you may remember that the girl from Subway said that when she left, the man left at the same time. So what police believe happened here is that he left, he went home, he changed his clothes, He came back and then he staked out the place because there was a couple of like hours in between her leaving and Katie being abducted and that he sat outside and he watched the store. He watched to make sure that nobody was in there. And then when he went in the first time and they were having like their friendly conversation, he was ensuring there was no one in the store. And then he walked out and let her get her guard down and then went in and took her. Donald was a little inconsistent with his story though. Like he said that he put her in the fire pit in the fetal position and that he then burned her body with wood and paper, but apparently wooden paper would not have been sufficient to completely break down the body the way it was. So that was a little bit weird. He would also go between saying that it was Katie who he killed, but then not confirming it. And then when asked like for clarity, like, was it Katie? Is it Katie's body in the fire pit? He would just be like, I don't know, I guess so. So now police had the horrible task of informing Katie's family that she was gone. This family that had been holding out hope for so long that she was okay was now gonna learn that their daughter was never coming home. I guess the the officer went to her parents' house and he had all the immediate family there and he stood in the center of the room and he told them like, he's confessed, he's confessed to killing her. And at the time they knew he'd been arrested. They know he had been arrested for the kidnapping, but they were still holding out hope that she was somehow alive out there. But now they knew that that just wasn't the case, that she was gone and she was never coming back. The maroon and gold ribbons once given to searchers as a sign of inspiration were now handed out to wear in Katie's memory. But it's fucked up, dude. Her family didn't even really get a chance to have that closure at all, if closure's the right word here, because closure, I don't believe, really is possible. But they weren't able to get even a moment of peace because Donald recanted his confession, dude. He literally recanted his confession. He said that at the time that he confessed, he had been under the stress of solitary confinement which was making him a little loopy, that in combination with the 10 medications he was taking had made him admitted to something, had made him admitted, had made him admit to something that he didn't do. But the DA was like, listen, you can recant all you want. I feel like we have enough evidence, albeit circumstantial evidence to cook your goose. So we're going to take this to trial. Donald's trial began in June of 2000 and over 50 witnesses were called to testify during the case. The police played the video surveillance tape and they also heard testimony from those two women that he kidnapped back in 1983, who eerily both resembled Katie, by the way. And his confession was presented as evidence against him, which is interesting since he recanted. I don't know if that's common, but it was. A forensic odontologist or a forensic dentist for us simpler folk testified that the tooth found in the fire pit was consistent with Katie's age and gender and all that jazz that it seemed to be Katie's tooth. And strangely enough, they even had um, Donald Barber testify to let people know that at the time that Katie had disappeared, because remember he cut his hair to change it. His barber was like, listen, 
his hair was longer and his tips of his hair were dyed blonde, which is probably what made him look younger in the surveillance video. But remember the surveillance video said his hair was dyed differently. So that's why they had the barber testify that this had been true, that Donald did have hair like that at the time Katie disappeared. Donald did try to say it wasn't him, obviously. He said it wasn't him, that he hadn't been there, that he'd never seen Katie before, that he didn't own a Yankees jersey like that, that he just wasn't the guy. But his, his own brother, dude, his own brother testified, and he's like, actually, the thing is, I gave Donald a big old box of clothes, and inside that big old box of clothes was that Yankees jersey. So he definitely had it. But then his wife, Donald's wife, testified um, for him, saying that she had never seen the jersey. But as we already know, Donald's wife has lied for him in the past already. So I wouldn't have believed much of what she said at that point. His wife testified for him a bit. Like she testified that for the defense a bit. She said that the night that Katie disappeared, her husband had gotten home at about 9:30 that night, which is well before Katie was abducted and that the two had just hung out together before going to bed together. And that the next morning she woke up to find a fresh pot of coffee. So she knew that he had been home all night and likely had not left. Now something super weird that she says, is the reason she remembered so clearly that Donald had been home and the reason that this was like a memory that was clear to her. Because if you think about it, like think about last Thursday in your life. Do you remember what you did? I surely don't. Like I would not have a timeline of mine or my husband's accountings. Um, if it was not a day that stuck out in our memory as important, if it was just a normal day, like it presumably would have been for them if they were not involved, right? If Donald was not involved and this was a normal day, why would you remember it? That's kind of what my brain thinks of. Like I wouldn't, unless I was like, oh, my husband like killed somebody that day. It sticks out in my mind because of that. But the reason she says it sticks out in her mind is because after Katie went missing, she was like, oh, there's a missing girl. And my husband has a record for assaulting and hurting women. So I should probably remember where he was and at one time in case they come to look at him as a suspect because they probably will and i want to make sure all the bases are covered that to me is a very strange um like line of thought you know what i mean like a strange thought process that i just don't understand but i'm also not married to a convicted fucking creep right i'm married to a sweet baby angel who's currently sleeping in a rocking chair with my son and is the sweetest but anyways she also testified that the police in this case were shady and that they had threatened to take away her kids if she didn't answer questions the way they wanted her to. And as she testified, Donald cried. Donald's attorney did the best they could with what they had, I guess. Um, they tried to say that, look, for one, all of the witnesses who looked at Donald in a lineup did not pick him out, right? Like not everybody recognized him, which is something. And the second thing is they brought in their own fores forensic dentist to contradict what the prosecution's forensic dentist had said, which is so wild to me. It's always wild to me that you can have two people in the same profession that come up with totally different um, conclusions on the same evidence based on who's paying them. Donald's attorney argued that Donald wasn't the man. It wasn't the man with the bones and the teeth in his fire pit. It was somebody else. <laughs> his attorney tried to say that it was another person, a person that police had focused on a little bit in the beginning of their investigation but they had already ruled this guy out and found that he wasn't involved. Like he was a bad guy, but he wasn't the bad guy who did this. But I think that the defense was just trying to like bring up anything that could be seen as reasonable doubt. Like, Oh, don't look here. Look here. Like it could be this. So you better not sentence him because you could be wrong, but it wasn't super effective, especially since this guy was proven to like not be involved. And then the attorney told the court, like, listen, his confession was even bullshit. Like, it's not a real confession. He was under the stress of solitary confinement and under the stress of dealing with his life and his wife's life because him and his wife, their lives are ruined. And his wife has even talked about taking her own life and the stress just got to him. So he did whatever he needed to do. Donald did take the stand in his own defense. And he just essentially said that he wasn't the guy. He completely denied being involved in Katie's disappearance. And he said that, you know, confessing was a mistake, that he was sick at the time. And he just said whatever he needed to say to get out of solitary confinement. And it just seemed like he tried his best to make the jury feel sorry for him. And he got really frustrated. He got really frustrated at being questioned. He was on the stand for like three hours or like three and a half. He was up there for a while. And at the end of the um, questioning, frustrated he like turned to the judge and he was like can i make a statement and the judge was like no no you cannot please shh, 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 shh. no the judge did however give katie's family a chance to talk and katie's mom pam went in 
on Donald. She really let him have it so badly that the, the defense attorney was like objecting, saying that it was improper. And she responded with like, give it a rest. It's my turn to talk. And things got so bad that they actually had to stop the court proceedings. They had to st take a 40 minute recess, if you will, because things got so heated between Pam and Donald. She told Donald, like, I, I'm looking at you and I want you to look at me. I want you to get my face in your mind. I want you to see my face in your dreams, bro. And he responded, snapping back at her. And he's like, you've got the wrong fucking guy. Like, look all you want at me. It's not going to make me be the person who took your daughter. So as I said, the judge was like, okay, everybody needs like a minute to cool down. And as people are let out of the courtroom, like other people had to like restrain Donald. Like it got, the drama was real. Like, obviously, it's a really fucked up situation. I can see why tensions would be so high, but you don't often hear. Maybe it happens more often than we think, but I don't often hear about, like, them having to separate people and, like, break up the courtroom and all of that during these proceedings. But I'm surprised it doesn't happen more. I feel like I would have been Pam in a heartbeat. Once the court um, proceeded, Donald reiterated that he was not the guy, that confessing and recanting was a stupid thing to do. And that if he could do anything to prove that it wasn't him, he would do it. He spoke directly to Katie's family saying, and I quote, I have respect for you and feel sorry for what you lost. And I hope someday that it will come out. After hearing all there was to hear, the jury was sent to deliberate and they came back with their decision as juries do, obviously. And they had decided that Donald Bloom was guilty of first degree murder during the commission of a kidnapping. And he was given a life sentence, which was the mandatory sentence for a convicted sexual predator. And on top of that, he was given an additional 19 years for the gun charges, for the guns that were found on his uh, hunting property. When the verdict was read, Katie's brother said he was just filled with relief and he just wanted to hug everyone. He wanted to hug his parents. He wanted to hug the people who had supported his family so much. He wanted to hug anyone and everyone. And he says that now he has four children and that each one of them has a trait of Katie and that he reminds them of her all the time. And he said that Donald killed her body, but not her soul. Katie's mother said of the verdict, and I quote, he's just an evil person. And with this verdict, I'm pleased now that at least we got one more person off the street and we can protect our children from this person. And with that last statement, because it's like I saw a video of it, you can see the pain in her, oh, the pain in her eyes because like she wasn't able to protect her child from this person, which like obviously she couldn't, like there's nothing that anyone could have done. But when she says that, you can just see that thought. I can see that thought flash before her eyes when she says it. And she just essentially says like, yeah, it's great. He's still going to jail. Like he's going to jail, but we still lost because our daughter's not coming home. The same thing that Ryan Poston's family said in the um, Ryan Poston and Shayna Huber's video that I just did. Like there isn't a real like win here because you're still not bringing your loved one home. They're still gone. Like somebody's going to jail. That's great. That's cool. But like what I want is my kid, <laughs> my kid, right? So as always, Donald appealed his conviction and his attorney said their most appealable like point that they were stressing was the fact that Donald's um, confession was used against him, even though he recanted it, which was something that stood out to me as well. Cause I thought that you don't do that, but that's part of why they appealed. So by the time that Donald appealed, one of his biggest supporters, his wife at the time had turned on him where before she said that he had gotten home around nine 30 that night with him saying it was actually 10. She was now saying that this wasn't the case that Donald had not come home at all the night that Katie disappeared. And she said that she was coming forward now and she hadn't been because now they weren't together anymore. They were no longer married. And that while they had been together and while they had been married, Donald had been abusing the shit out of her. She said that he had been kicking her and punching her for almost 10 straight years. And her, ch her child, her son confirmed this abuse. She said that he had lied to her about who he really was, that he had never told her that he had been married twice before and that he had made her believe that when they got married, um, he took her last name because that's what happened. He took her last name, very progressive. And she thought he did it because he loved her. But in reality, he did it just to change his identity. Okay. Which is what he did a lot. And that she said he was at the Moose Lake property a lot, but he would never tell her what he was going there for. He was very secretive about it. And the most damning thing for him, besides the whole not coming home the night that Katie disappeared was that his wife, his ex-wife now believed that he was responsible for Katie's murder and was responsible for additional murders. 
So needless to say, Donald's appeal was not successful and his conviction was upheld. Um, and after he was arrested, Minnesota decided it was time to tighten down their um, laws regarding repeat offenders for sex offenders. And they made it so there would be longer mandatory sentences for people who did this shit over and over. And this was commonly known as Katie's Law. So a few years after his arrest in 2006, Donald decided that he wanted to come clean and he wanted to give police some information on some additional unsolved crimes, unsolved murders, unsolved disappearances in their areas. He said that he would only do it if he could be transferred to a prison that was closer to his relatives, just like he wanted before. And so they were like, um, hell yeah, we'd love to close some of these damn cases and give these families some closure. So they went and got permission for this transfer for Donald. A senior cold case detective named Dennis said that he really did believe that Donald had multiple victims um, under his belt and that he had believed this for a long time. And they were really hoping that by speaking to Donald, they would be able to get some information and put some of these cases to rest. And he said specifically of this, and I quote, we were hoping to solve some homicide cases, probably dating back to the seventies. His own admission was that he often would leave for entire nights, would be using alcohol and drugs, and would not remember when he came home the next day, where he had been, or what he had did. So when police arrived to speak to Donald with the transfer in hand, he did talk. He talked, and he talked, and he talked for three straight days, but he didn't confess to any additional crimes, so police were like, okay, I guess this is a wash, and they left. But that didn't stop them from believing that he was responsible for additional murders. There are a few cases of missing or murdered women that Donald has been linked to, but he hasn't been conclusive, conclusively linked to in such a way where he can be charged for them. First, when Donald was arrested, they were looking into him in connection to the murder of a 19-year-old woman named Holly Spangler. She was an architect from Wisconsin, and her decomposing body was found in the woods of a Minnesota park that Donald lived near. And at the time, he was going under a different name, the name Donald Pence. Under this name, he was a registered sex offender and he lived right by where this happened. So they were like, they really believe that he is such a strong suspect for her murder, but they just can't prove that he did it. Additionally, Donald was looked at in connection with the strangulation murder of a woman named Wilma Johnson, whose, whose body was found in 1983 near the St. Paul Cathedral. And Donald admitted to being at the crime, admitted to being at the crime scene, but said that he was not the one who killed her. Oh, I, did, I almost forgot about this. Apparently, Donald did admit to police that he may have killed a man near St. Paul's High Bridge, but he wasn't sure, and a body has never been found, so they've never been able to prove or connect him to a murder um, to which he described. Dennis, the cold case investigator, was asked, do you think Donald will go to his grave, a serial killer? And Dennis responded with simply, I believe he will. I believe he will. And at this point, Donald is 73 years old, and I can't imagine it's going to be that long before he kicks the bucket because it's not like he's taking good care of himself or living his best life in prison. So if he doesn't say anything soon, people will probably never know. And now I want to end this video with a quote, a quote from Katie's mother that really, I think, solidifies the fact that this is a real thing. I feel like with true crime videos, I've said this before, that sometimes it's easy to disassociate and forget that these are real people. Like, you know it, but you don't think about it. And I feel like quotes like this really show that this is a real thing. This is a real thing that happened to a real person. And the effects of losing this person are lasting. And people don't really heal from this. They don't recover fully from things like this. And Pam said of losing her daughter, Katie, and I quote, when they say your heart breaks, it literally is breaking. And you can feel this emptiness, this pain that goes on. And with that quote, that my friends is the story of the murder of Katie Hoyer. Isn't that just so wild? Like it's so intense. There's so much to it. And it's crazy to me that this isn't a case that's discussed more because it seems like the type of case that people would talk about. From the fact that she was abducted on camera, you can watch it happen to the fact that Donald is possibly a serial killer into the fact that he was brought down by a tooth filling. It just seems like the type of thing that people would talk about, but for whatever reason, they're just like not. And I, I just don't get it. As soon as I heard it, maybe they just haven't heard about it. Now they have, because I just, as soon as I heard about it, I was like, this is, this is insane. 
And to me, man, this doesn't seem like a spur of the moment thing for him. I know he's like, I just went to the convenience store and just took her. Like, I don't think so. He seemed prepared. He seemed calm, cool, and collected. He seems like he's done this before. And I mean, they found another person's bones in that fire pit. And now that I've told you all that I have to say, I now want to revisit the question of the day. And that was this. Do you believe that Katie's murderer is a serial killer? And if not, what do you believe his motive was? Leave your answers in the comments below. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative and it gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, thank you for remembering Katie with me today. She seemed like a beautiful girl who literally had her whole life going for her and her loss is felt very heavily in the hearts of those who loved her. Before I go, guys, please make sure to leave me any suggestions down below of cases you'd like to see me cover in the future. As this case shows, if you leave me a suggestion, I may cover the case you want to see me cover. Um, I love hearing your guys' suggestions. You bring cases to me that I've never heard of before. Never heard of before. Never heard of before like this one. And cases that need more coverage like this one. And I know you're filled with good ideas and good tastes. Otherwise, you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. All my social media will be listed down below for your convenience. If you want to hang out more consistently, I'm pretty active on most of those platforms. And um, I will also have below a link to my merch store along with some lists, some lists, some other true crime channels listed down below in case you like mine, you might like theirs as well. And now with all that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.